Hello, this is Dr. Lauren Loudon, continuing on in this series of mini lectures addressing Illumina sequencing. So we left off at the end of cluster generation where you make a set of DNA fragments from your original DNA molecule in the library, and then you wash off all the P5, so you're left with all P7 strands. So they're all exactly identical. Five prime anchor down here and three prime up here. And then what? Next we move on into conducting sequencing by synthesis, and we do that, we break that out into four steps. So first, we're gonna sequence what's called read one. And the read one is gonna be done by annealing the read one primer, which is shown in blue here, with its primer binding site, and then sequencing down from there. And sequencing means synthesizing. So we're gonna synthesize down from here, and we're gonna use sequence by synthesis. So each time we incorporate a nucleotide, it's one of the reversible di-terminator nucleotides that I talked about in an earlier segment of these mini lectures. And so a flash of light will go off and tell us what nucleotide has been added. And this is happening not at one strand, but across all the clonal clusters. And in fact, all the clusters in all of the lanes on the entire chip all at the same time in a massively parallel manner. And we'll sequence down, in our case, 250 base pairs. Okay, um, but other protocols might require different amounts of sequencing. When you're done, you stop the reaction by not unblocking the last nucleotide, not regenerating that 3' hydroxyl group. You wash the sequencing product off, so you get rid of all of this. You wash out all the fluorophores, and then you're going to move on, and you're going to sequence index 7. You're going to sequence this sequence down here as your next step. So what this first step did is it got us the sequence of read one, which is this end of the DNA molecule of interest, or molecules of interest. So next we're going to go on and we're going to sequence the I7, the index area. And that's shown down here in green, and there's a binding site for the primer, and here's the primer. It's going to bind through complementary base pairing, and then we'll sequence by synthesis the length of the I7 index sequence. And so what that does is it's the first of two barcodes because our samples are dual indexed or have two index sequences. And that's going to allow us to link this initial read one sequence to a particular sample, like a particular bacterium in our case. All right, what next? And then things get like slightly more complicated looking. So just going back up here, remember that these sequences at the end are complementary to the P5 graph. So we take advantage of that. And what we do is we change conditions so that bridging happens again. So complementary base pairing happens here. And then I had said earlier that the I5, the index sequence 5 sequence primer, is actually integrated right into the P5 graph. So we don't have to add anything. It's already built in. And then we have sequencing by synthesis happening here. Okay, And so that's going to give us index number 5 sequence. And then we go on, and the last step is to sequence read 2. And before we do that, we have to actually regenerate the P5 strands. So, so far we sequenced read 1, index 7, and index 5, traveling in this direction and using the P7 side as the template. And that's just not going to work because of orientation for sequencing read 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to redo bridge amplification, a round or two of bridge amplification. I'm not sure exactly how many rounds you have to do, actually. And we're going to go from this to this, and we're going to regenerate clonal clusters that are only P5s. So we'll use this as template. We'll build up a whole bunch of the mixture, and then we'll wash off or eliminate the P7s, leaving us, in this case, with only P5s. And there are P5s only, we don't only have one of them, we have a whole clonal cluster of them. And we're going to then anneal the I7, the index number 7 sequence primer up here. And we're going to sequence that, um, that region. Okay, Sorry, we're, we're annealing not the I7 sequence primer, I misspoke there. We're annealing the primer for read 2. And it's going to bind here in the same general region as where the I7 sequence primer bound on the previous strand. Okay. And then that is the start of read 2, which is a sequence that's actually belonging to our DNA of interest, not just an index sequence. So 
there's there is the direction of synthesis, always using the template three prime to five prime. That's what I meant by orientation. And we'll let that go for, in our case, 250 base pairs. Um, our index sequences are only like eight to 10 nucleotides long, so those are much shorter bursts of sequences. But read one and read two, we want to sequence 250 base pairs um, of DNA, of nucleotide sequence in those. And that's the end of our four steps. We've sequenced read one, the index seven, the index five, and read number two. And this index information, by the way, is also going to give us the ability to relate the, the um, read number two data back to the original sample ID uh, to which the DNA of interest belonged. All right, so what? Like, what's this read one, read two thing? Okay, so I want to go back to the original library. Okay, and if we were to zoom in on just the gray DNA of interest in the original read library, what we would learn that uh, is that Illumina um, sequencing, when you're using the paired end methodology, will sequence two ends of a fragment of DNA, and it will sequence the opposite strands of those two ends. In our case, it's sequencing 250 base pairs on one side and 250 base pairs on the other side. And it will do this sequencing and then this sequencing. And so if you were to look at one spot, let's go back to our image of a chip, right? All those steps are happening at one location, each of these one locations in sequence. So if we focus back in on this spot number one, okay? This is showing us sequencing over time, and what will happen is you'll sequence read one, and that'll be like flash, 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 you know, 250 times of light, and that gives you the read one sequence. Then you sequence index seven, flash, 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 right, and you get that sequence. Then you sequence index five, flash, 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 and you get that sequence, and then you regenerate the other strand, that'll take a minute, and then you go in and you sequence that other strand, and the clonal clusters, because all of this is on such a tiny scale, they're not going to move. They're still going to be right there. So the read 2 light that is emitted is going to also be in the same physical location. And so it is, this, it is the physical attachment to a surface that allows the system to know that this particular read 1 goes with this particular read two. In other words, they're sequenced from what was the same original continuous piece of DNA. And that information is really useful in applying these sequences to the process of assembly or lining them all up to get longer continuous regions that can ultimately become chromosomes and provide us with meaningful genetic information. And that's what paired end reads um, mean. Not all sequencing protocols use uh, paired end methodology. Um, some only use, you know, one read in one direction, and some only have one index sequence. So there's some variations on what we've just looked at, and I'm showing what is done on the samples from my laboratory. So an added note about that is that the original library for us was prepared by um, size sorting these DNA fragments so that they're going to be in the range of 350 base pairs to 550 base pairs. So let's just think about that for a minute, okay? If read 1 and read 2 are each 250 base pairs, then if this total length is only 350 base pairs, there's not going to be an inner distance or gap. These are actually going to overlap. And then we're going to be in a situation where we have complementary sequence, which is actually useful and can help you know, reduce um, errors in assembly. Now, if this fragment was 550 base pairs long, which will happen with our samples, there will be a little bit of inner distance, so there'd be about 50 base pairs, in fact, in the middle, and so then they wouldn't overlap. But because the read 1 and the read 2 are lighting up at the same spot, the Illumina system still knows that they're connected on the, in the same physical plane, that they're part of the same original piece of, of DNA. Um, and so that, all that information is utilized in the assembly and analysis process. So just again, um, a little bit about um, these little bits of DNA and making sense of them. We're going to be talking about assembly in future uh, lectures and classes. But the impact of the insert size and how much you sequence. Like in our project, we're doing 250 base pair, paired end reads. Not all projects will do paired ends, and not all projects will have fragments that are this long. 
Some will be longer, that's now possible. Many will be shorter. So originally you could only get, I think, maybe 80 base pairs or, or 50. This is actually a pretty, pretty decent amount of data. In contrast, Sanger sequencing can give you a maximum of about a thousand base pairs of sequence, but only one sequence at a time. In this case, you're sequencing literally millions of these fragments all at the same time, and you're getting 250 base pairs times two from each chunk from millions of fragments, which is pretty, pretty amazing and awesome. So a couple last things about the process of Illumina sequencing, and I'll really just gloss over this concept, but the index sequences are used to relate each sample, each sequence back to an actual biological sample. So this is a cartoon showing a mouse study, not a bacterial study, but here you have three different, these researchers had three different mice and they were named S1, S2, and S3. And they took DNA from each of these three mice, and then ultimately they pooled that, they made libraries out of it, and they pooled that DNA, ran it across a flow cell, and did sequencing. And that means taking all this carefully sorted information and then jumbling it all together again. So you have to have a way to unjumble or sort or bin that information, B-I-N, in order to make it biologically and genetically useful. And so the way that that is done is by multiplexing samples, which means using index sequences that relate back to the original ID, and then informatically using those sequences to do something called demultiplexing, which is sorting each sequence into the appropriate bin or biological sample ID. And that's, um, that's an incredibly important step, and uh, there'll be more on that in, in future sources. So that's what all I'm going to say about Illumina sequencing. If you feel like your head might be exploding, um, I just want to remind you that that's actually really good for you. It makes you smart to regularly work your heart so your brain so hard that it, it feels like it's going to blow up. Um, really helps us to get mentally stronger when we struggle with difficult concepts like this. And you're certainly not alone in struggling with these diff difficult concepts. A quick scan of the internet will tell you just how many people are trying to figure all of this out. So other uh, things I want to remind you about is that learning something tough like Illumina sequencing requires you to use a lot of very fundamental information about DNA and DNA synthesis, like what a 5' prime and a 3' prime is and how DNA polymerases work. So if you can actually master that, then you, um, you are really um, ahead of a lot of other folks on understanding molecular biology and therefore being able to do bioinformatics. Um, and this is a really great kind of boot camp to pull you up to speed in that area if you, if you need to learn a little bit more. Another thing is that you can't really do bioinformatics well without knowing where the data comes from because you can't do quality control on data without knowing how it's generated. And that's really critical. And all of that knowledge will translate into making you more competent in these areas and that has a lot of application for future work and study environments. And then again, working your brain hard makes it stronger. So that's all on this series of how Illumina sequencing works.